Now, we bring you a world of adventure with... Rocky Jordan. I was sitting alone in my cafe tambourine when Paulette Martin came to my table. I remembered her from three years back. She was the kind you remember. But now she seemed scared, said she was being followed. Paulette showed me a large manila envelope, said what was inside was worth a lot of dough. I thought she was just playing cops and robbers for the excitement of it, but when she made a private phone call from my office and didn't come back fast enough, I got that old feeling that it was going to be one of those nights. I made for my office on the double. Paulette Martin was gone. She'd left the manila envelope with me for safekeeping. I tore it open. Inside were two x-ray plates. Down in the lower left-hand corner was the name Dr. Konstantin Markov. Then I remembered what I'd seen in the newspaper just an hour ago. Dr. Konstantin Markov had been found at 10 that morning in his office on the Sharia Romar. He'd been knifed to death. On a narrow street, not far off Cairo's native quarter, stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Dr. Markov's Discovery. I slipped the x-ray plates in my desk drawer and walked around to the door leading into my cafe. A small gray-haired gent in a derby hat was standing at the bar. He was watching me over the rim of his glass. Then his mouth moved slightly. The two men who stood on either side of him with their backs to me turned slowly, leaned against the bar, peered at me through the smoky haze. Then I noticed a cabbie pushing his way through the crowd headed in my direction. His eyes skipped around the cafe as if he were looking for somebody. As he came up, he took his cap off, started twisting it in his hand. Uh, a thousand pardons. You are Mr. Jordan? Yeah. I, I, the young lady I drove here in my cab, I believe she said she was coming to see you. What about it? Uh, she told me to wait, Mr. Jordan. She said she would only be a minute, but already... Now she's gone, uh, friend. Gone? But no, she did not pay me. She owed me 50 piastres. She promised to give me 50 piastres. All right, all right. Your evening won't be a total loss. We can do business. Your cab outside? Yes, yes, Mr. Jordan. A fine automobile. An excellent automobile. A wonderful... Okay, you sold me on it. Yeah, this will do as a retainer. I may need you for a little while. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll be out in a minute. I figured I'd check on why the x-rays were worth so much dough first. I went back into the office, picked up the x-rays, and walked out through the cafe. Three pair of very interested eyes followed me all the way. George, the cabbie, was sitting at the wheel of his hack, grinning from ear to ear. I gave him the address, and we drove off. A quarter of an hour later, I was walking along the 10th floor corridor of the Victoria Hospital looking for a guy named Fisher who ran the x-ray lab. After a series of left and right turns along the deserted, dimly lit halls, I finally pulled up in front of the x-ray lab. I reached for the doorknob. Then I heard it. Well, <laughs> it's a little late in the evening for x-rays, but I knocked anyway. I counted up to ten and opened the door. As I entered the lab, a door at the far end of the room closed silently. I walked over to a young gent in a white uniform who seemed to be very busy looking over some charts. Oh, hello, old man. Is there Fisher around? Uh, Fisher? F uh, oh, he beetled off about an hour ago. Won't be back tonight. Done him, you know. Completely bushed, as it were. Won't be back, huh? Are you his new assistant? Uh, no, no. I, I just pop over from med school now and then to uh, familiarize myself with the uh, equipment, shall we say? Uh, take a look at these for me, will you? Oh, yes, of course. Of course, old man. Hmm. I'd say they were x-rays. What do you think they were? Navigation charts of the upper St. Lawrence River? Oh, yes, I see, I see. Mm. It's rather interesting. Junior, upside down. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. I thought it rather odd. You see maybe. anything in them? Uh, no, no, I, I don't, old man. Awfully large stomach, though, really. Must be a very fat old thing. Yeah, hand them over. 
really, old man, I must confess I'm not too familiar with this sort of thing, actually. However... All right, all right, never mind. Uh, however, on the second floor, Dr. Kingston... Yes, I know. See you later. Uh, I say, old man, that's not the way out. That's the door to the closet. <gasps> and good night to you, too, sweetheart. I say, old Junior, man... Junior, you should know that nurses aren't allowed on this floor. Not even the pretty ones. Good night. Oh, and uh, wipe that lipstick off your collar. I went back out into the hall with the X-ray prints tucked under my arm and started for the elevators. But I didn't make it. Halfway down the corridor, a door opened suddenly. An arm shot out and I caught the fist in the side of my head and down I went on the cold white marble floor, listening to the footsteps hurry away down the corridor. I hadn't blacked out entirely. When I got to my feet a few seconds later, I looked around for the x-ray plates. They were gone. I hurried over to the elevators. Only one of them was in operation, so I started down the stairs. On the first landing, I bumped into them. I stopped. They stopped. There were three of them. Two tall, heavy-set gorillas flanking a small, slim gent with a derby hat. The characters I'd seen earlier in my cafe. Then the little guy reached for his hip pocket. Instead of a gun, he brought out his wallet and started up the stairs toward me. You alone. will come with us, Mr. Jordan. Well, you'll have to make me a good offer. Maybe a set of pickle dishes, huh? Perhaps, uh, perhaps this will persuade. I am Colonel Bukhar of the Istanbul Police. My credentials. Ah, Istanbul, huh? You're a little out of your territory. What's the matter, take the wrong streetcar? Shall we go, Mr. Jordan? Mind telling me where? Do you have a choice? A choice? Yes. Police headquarters or the morgue. When we got to police headquarters, Sam Sabaya was standing in the hall next to the water cooler. He and the colonel got their heads together for a moment, and then we all walked into Sam's office. The two gorillas stationed themselves at the door. Sam dropped into his swivel chair. The colonel started pacing the room. He seemed a little disappointed. So you know this man, Jordan, Captain Sabaya. Yes, yes, I know him, Colonel. Very well. Better luck next time, Colonel. It appears that he and the girl, uh, Paulette Martin... Ah, a woman. Yes, I might have known. I followed her to the cafe. This uh, cafe at... um, Tambourine. uh, Yes, as I was saying, Captain, I followed the girl to the cafe. She turned over an envelope to Jordan. Colonel. Yes? She didn't turn it over. She left it in the booth. And then she went into your office, is that right? Yeah, she went to make a phone call. When she didn't come back, You I... followed her. Later, you came out with the envelope under your arm. Sure. I went over to the Victoria Hospital. What happened to her, Jordan? I don't know. She ducked or somebody grabbed her out of my office. What were you and the girl up to, Jordan? Look, I hadn't seen Paulette Martin in over three years. Tonight she waltzed into my place with an envelope and gave me a pitch about joining her in some deal. What sort of a deal? She didn't get around to tell me. She went to my office to use the phone, and that's the last I saw of her. Jordan, what was in the envelope? Oh, a couple of x-rays, Sam. X-rays? What sort of x-rays? Just plain x-rays. Some guy's stomach. A st- Jordan, this is no time. Sam, I'm telling uh, you. Just a moment. Uh, Jordan, where are are those x-rays? I don't know. Somebody grabbed them away from me at the hospital. Uh, so somebody took them away from you, huh? Just like that. <laughs> the x-rays, Jordan. Were they from Dr. Markov's office? Uh, yeah. And the patient's name, it was also on the x-ray? I, uh, I don't remember. Look, would you mind telling me something? Uh, what is that? Why are the Istanbul police so interested in this routine? You do not know, of course. A lot of things I don't know about this, including why a guy's stomach is so important, how Paulette Martin got mixed up in this deal, and why she came to me. Just a minute. You did not know that Paulette Martin worked in Dr. Markov's office? No, I didn't know that. She was his receptionist. But, of course, you would not know now. You said you had not seen her in the last five years. Three. Uh, Yes. You still haven't answered my question, Colonel. Why is the Istanbul police interested? I don't intend to. Perhaps Captain Sabaya will tell you if he's so inclined. At the moment, I have work to do. Uh, Captain, I would like to talk to you for a moment uh, in private. Uh, Yes, yes, of course, Colonel. And with that, the Colonel's two boys eased me out of the office into the hall. We sat down on the bench and waited. Ten minutes later, the door opened and the little Colonel strutted out. He didn't even look at me as he went past. 
as two boys jumped up and trailed after him down the hall and out into the street. And that was that. I walked over to Sam's office. Sam was in his chair again. Come in, Jordan. Look, Sam, I love that guy, but what's he doing down here? Cairo's in Egypt, not Turkey. It concerns the murder of Dr. Marco. Uh, sit down, Jordan, sit down. Okay, shoot. About a week ago, Dr. Markov sent a wire to the Istanbul police requesting information of a very clever and dangerous convict named Brezak. Brezak? He died about five years ago, didn't he? Well, yes. After his escape from prison in Istanbul, he was drowned in the Black Sea. But there was never any positive proof that he actually was dead. The body was never recovered. So now, five years later, Dr. Markov, here in Cairo, suddenly starts asking questions about Brezak. What's he want to know, Sam? Merely if there was a possibility that Brezak was still alive. Nothing more. And the Istanbul police replied to the wire by sending down one of its prize bloodhounds, Colonel Bukhar. Yes. But when Colonel Bukhar arrived, he found that Dr. Markov had been murdered. Mm. What's Paulette Martin done to put the gleam in the little colonel's eye? Mm, nothing. I'm convinced she had nothing to do with the doctor's death. However... However, the colonel doesn't go along with the idea, huh? That's right. And now... <clears throat> Jordan, the patient's name and the x-rays. What was it? Oh, Griswold or Grisholm, I'm not sure. The first name was Jonathan. The address stops me. There were some threes and sevens, but I can't straighten them out. All right, Jordan. So if there's nothing further, I'd like to go back to my cafe. Yes, yes, of course. Thanks. Oh, and thanks for straightening things out for me with the hotshot colonel, Sam. I went back out into the street, and there was George, the grinning cabbie. He wasn't going to lose a paying customer if he could help it. Ten minutes later, we pulled up in front of 3337 Sharia Kubri. The guy who lived there was named Kashubian, and he tried to sell me a rug. Next, we tried 3733. It was a small shop and closed for the night. Number 3737 turned out to be an empty lot, so we mushed on. A little later, we pulled up in front of 7337 on the classy side of town and hit the jackpot. It was a two-story brownstone house. The native houseboy led me into the library where I met Mr. Griswold himself, all 280 pounds. He was sitting behind a desk, a napkin tucked under his chin, gnawing on a drumstick. In his other hand was a piece of celery. Come in, sir, come in. Come in, a plate for the gentleman. You'll uh, join me, sir? Yeah, thanks, none. Glass of wine, then. Dominic, a glass for Mr... Uh, uh, Jordan. 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 Well, then. Pleasure, sir. Pleasure. Now, sit down, sit down. You'll excuse me. No, oh, yeah. I... go right ahead. Nothing like a bit of bird and a bottle of fine wine before retiring and all. So you won't join me, huh? No, thanks, sir. Well, then. Now, Mr. Jordan, to what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? Dr. Markov. Oh. Dr. <clears throat> Markov. Well, he's dead, sir. Just this morning. I read about it. Sad. Yes, I know him. He took some x-rays of you recently, didn't he? X-rays? Yeah, indeed, sir. Indeed he did. But how did you know? A doll named Paulette Martin waltzed into my cafe tonight. She said they were worth a lot of dough. Any idea why? See here, Mr. Jordan. Is this some sort of a... Excuse me. I don't think so, Griswold. I took the x-rays over to a friend of mine at the Victoria Hospital. On the way out, I was slugged and relieved of the x-rays. I don't understand, sir. Why would anyone go to all that trouble for x-rays of my... My God, sir, it's preposterous. I must say I don't like the idea of my... Excuse me, my stomach being battered about Cairo from pillar to post in this manner. No, sir, I don't enjoy it one bit. Rather indecent, don't you think? After all... All right, all right, Griswold, relax. I think I see the pitch. Sorry I bothered you. Uh, one moment, sir. I... Pardon me. I want to know more of this. Some other uh... time, Griswold. I'm in a hurry. See you around. I went back out into the street. George, the cabbie, was sitting on the front steps of the house waiting for me. We, we were successful, Mr. Jordan. We were, George? We were. Now, do you know where Dr. Nuruddin lives? Dr. Nu the famous surgeon? Yeah, yeah. No, Mr. Jordan. But I'm sure you will have no difficulty. So am I, George. Okay, hoist up your patees and let's away to the nearest telephone booth. If anybody would know about unusual x-rays, it would be the surgeon, Nuruddin. At 9.45, I was ushered into his study. At 10 o'clock, Dr. Nuruddin and I had a glass of sherry, and at precisely 10.15, I left, 
with a small pencil sketch he had made. It was the kicker to the case, and I tucked it safely away in my breast pocket. Five minutes later, I put in a call to Captain Sam Sabaya. Yes, yes, Jordan. What is it now? Uh, meet me at Dr. Markov's office in ten minutes, Sam. I'll tell you all about it then. Oh, and bring the key. Just a minute, Jordan. Bring I... the key, Sam. Bring the office key. <laughs> Sam was already standing at the entrance to the small office building in the Sharia Romar when I got there. We went inside and started across the lobby. Well, Jordan, what is this all about? Oh, it was a sucker play from the start, Sam. A little Paulette started it. The x-ray plates she slipped me were phonies. It dawned on me while I was talking to Griswold. Griswold? Who is Griswold? The guy with a stomach. But he doesn't figure. Now, see how this shapes up. Paulette Martin has the real plates. She's holding on to them, see? Mm -hmm. When the doc gets bumped, she gets scared, figuring she's next. Mm -hmm. To throw the murderer off her trail, she picks up a phony set of plates from the office, Griswold's, and waltzes into my cafe with them. I see. Now, sure, while the murderer's trailing me, Paulette slips away with the real plates. Mm -hmm. oh, here is Dr. Markov's office. Now, what do you want in here, Jordan? Fast browse through the good doctor's files. Oh. Oh, hold it, Sam. What's the matter? Somebody's coming up the stairs. Come on, let's get out of sight. A few seconds later, a woman came into the corridor. It wasn't Paulette Martin, and she stopped in front of Markov's office. She stood there looking at the name on the door, raised her hand slowly, and gently brushed the gold lettering with her fingertips. Then she opened her purse, took out a key, unlocked the door, and went inside. Hmm. I wonder what she's doing here. Do you know her, Sam? Yes, her name is Anita Loman. She was Dr. Markov's nurse, came back from Alexandria this morning in time to discover his body. How'd she take it? Uh, badly. I think she... I think she was in love with the doctor. Huh? You sure she was in Alexandria last night? Oh, yes, yes. We checked it. Come on. Nurse Loman was standing before a filing cabinet with half a dozen manila folders in her hand when we walked in. She turned slowly, then gave out with a thin little smile. Captain Sabaya, I'm glad you're here. Good evening, Miss Lomon. Uh, this is Mr. Jordan. Miss Lomon? How do you do, Mr. Jordan? Captain Sabaya, when I spoke to you at headquarters this morning, I I, I was terribly upset. Yes, I, yes, I know. I, I don't know why I didn't think of it before, but all the shock of finding, finding Dr. Marco. You have uncovered something, Miss Lomon? I believe so. It suddenly came to me this afternoon. I was trying to find some reason why, why anyone would... Want to take Dr. Markov's life. And then I suddenly remembered. The day before I left for Alexandria, a man went in to see Dr. Markov. They were in the doctor's private office for quite some time. This man sounded very angry. He, he seemed to be after some x-rays. Go on, Miss Lomon. This man's name, do you remember? I, I'm not certain. If I could only find the files, they, they seem to have been rearranged. Yeah, I'd say the murderer took care of that. What did he look like? Oh, he was slender, middle-aged. I saw him only twice, the day he was brought in, but... A moment, Miss Lamont. You say he was brought in? Yes. It was late afternoon. There was an accident in the street. This man was hit by an automobile. He wasn't seriously hurt, though quite dazed. After he was brought in, he complained of pains in his head. And Dr. Markov took x-rays? Yes. A short time later, however, the man seemed perfectly normal... Doctor sent him home and told him he'd be around to see him that evening. If I could only find those x-rays... Oh, I... you won't, Miss Loman, but... Uh, here, take a look at this. Mm. Would the x-rays look something like this? I took the piece of paper Dr. Nuruddin had given me out of my pocket and spread it out on the desk. On it was drawn the head of a man in profile. Directly behind the ear at the base of the skull was a small area shaded in red pencil. The girl began studying it. Jordan, where did you get this paper? Dr. Nuruddin, you've heard of the surgeon, haven't you, Sam? I went over to see him before I called you on the phone. He drew the sketch for me, describing an operation that was performed over 12 years ago in Prague. An operation? Yeah, on this guy, Brazak. Well, this was several years before he went to prison. Brazak was hurt in a hunting accident. His family had a lot of dough, and they hired a surgeon from Vienna. This is his work, Sam. Uh, Mr. Jordan, this shaded area behind the ear... That's a silver plate, Miss Loman. Brazak has a silver plate in his skull. Colonel Bukhar didn't mention that to you, did he, Sam? Uh, how did Dr. Nuruddin know all this? Well, the operation was widely discussed years ago. It appeared in a flock of medical journals. Seems there was a little criticism here and there. The operation wasn't too successful. It wasn't? 
But Brazak... Oh, sure. Brazak pulled through okay and resumed his role as playboy of the Balkans. But the plate gave him trouble from time to time. Nothing serious. You say all this took place before he went to prison. What did he... Well, he got mixed up in a little deal in Istanbul later. Politics and the death of a countess named Montclair. Brezak was sent to prison for life. He'd only served a few years when he escaped and was supposed to have drowned in the Black Sea. Well, then, Mr. Jordan, does this mean that this man Brezak is still alive? That, that you're able to identify him by this, this silver plate? If we had the x-rays, this piece of work could probably be identified as easily as if the surgeon had signed his name on the silver plate. That's what made your Dr. Markov send the wire to the Istanbul police requesting information of Brezak. Now, if we have the x-ray plates with the patient's name Look, on it... Look, Sam, we're wasting time. There's still an outside chance we can grab Paulette Martin before she skips. Perhaps she doesn't intend to skip. All right, we'll try both angles. <laughs> Sam got to work on the phone and told his boys to cover the airports, train, and bus depots. From Nurse Lomond, I got half a dozen addresses where Paulette might be holding in. Sam picked out three addresses and raced off in the police car. Armed with the other three, George, the cabbie, and I took off. George and I connected on the second address, a small three-story apartment house alongside the Dorchester Tower building. Paulette was just coming out of the apartment house when she saw us. She had a good head start, and by the time we pulled up, she ducked into the tower building. When we raced into the lobby, a scrub woman was standing there with her hands on her hips, muttering to herself and looking up the stairway. Mr. Jordan, this way, up this stairs. Look, George, I'll take the stairs. You grab one of the elevators. Go up to the top floor and work down. Get it? Yes, yes, I understand, Mr. George. It was rough going by the time it hit the sixth floor. I could hear Paulette above me racing up the stairs. Then I stopped. I couldn't hear her anymore. I eased up to the seventh floor slowly. On the next landing, I found her shoes. Paulette was doing better now in her stocking feet. On the tenth floor, I ran into George. Mr. Jordan, did you see her? Ah, no, that, that dame runs like a deer. Come on, George, let's go back up. She must be up there. Perhaps the roof, Mr. Jordan. It is possible... Here, here, come on. When we reached the roof, it was deserted. We eased up the tower and directly under the huge clock. At the head of the spiral stairway was a door. We walked into the small room. The light was on, but the room was empty. As we started to turn around, the door slammed shut. We were locked in. Mr. Jordan, the ladder there. Perhaps we can get above... Okay, that... George, you try it. I'll see what I can do on this door. Yes, yes, there must be some way. For an instant, I didn't know what had happened. The shock had jarred the room like it was built on a plate of jello. Then I remembered we were directly under the huge bell of Dorchester Towers, Cairo's version of the Big Ben. <laughs> I shook the sound out of my brain and looked at my watch. Quarter to twelve. Then I looked over at George, the grinning cab driver. He wasn't grinning now. He was flattened out against the wall, his face gray with fear. And there was a wild look in his eyes. Mr. Jordan, we must get out of here. We must get out of here. Yeah, yeah, relax, George. We got 15 minutes before the bell opens up again. 15 minutes? 15 minutes? Yeah, it's quarter to twelve now. Midnight, we're in for another session. Unless we can... No! No! We must get out of here! Well, I was in favor of that, too. But I didn't see any reason to get so excited about it. George scurried up the ladder and tried to open the trap door. It didn't budge. I went to work on the other door with my knife. All I came up with after ten minutes was a couple of broken blades. George kept clawing at the trap overhead, but he wasn't getting anywhere. He was like a wild man now. The minutes ticked by. George threw both hands over his ears and crouched in the corner of the room. Then it hit again. George dropped to his knees, shook his head, then staggered to his feet like a drunken man. He fell against the wall, covered his face with his hand. A ribbon of blood trickled down the corner of his mouth, and he started clawing at the side of his head, digging his nails into the scalp just behind the ear. Realized that he was the gent on the X-rays. George the cabbie was Brasock, the gent with a silver plate in his skull. And right now the vibrations weren't doing him any good. <laughs> George, get me out! Get me out of here! I can't stand any more of it. What do you want me to do, Brasock? I don't know. I don't know. Get me out! <laughs> I can't stand anymore. Do something. Okay, Brasak. You took me into it. 
tapped him with all I had on the point of the jaw, and he went limp. Razak didn't have to worry about the bell anymore. In a moment, Rocky Jordan returns with the ending to tonight's story. When Republicans and Democrats, labor and capital, rich and poor, all agree, that's news. And they do agree on at least one subject, The Miracle of America, a free booklet available to everyone. Write for your free copy and learn why being an American is the greatest gift mankind knows today. Address Miracle of America in care of the CBS station to which you're listening for your free copy of the vital and informative booklet, The Miracle of America, right today. And now we return you to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. I took the rest of the midnight sonata, and a few minutes later, the door to the tower opened. Sam was standing in the doorway. At the other end of the handcuffs was Paulette Martin. Well, that's the way it ended. When Paulette found out that Brezak was using an assumed name, she got the idea she'd blackmail him for the plates. Brezak, thinking Dr. Markov was in on the deal, went over and killed him. Paulette got scared and came to me, and you know the rest. I went back to my cafe, and a couple hours later, Sam showed up in my office. He was wearing a grin from ear to ear beating out the hotshot colonel for the capture of Brazak, alias George the Cabby, had done it. Have a cigar, Jordan. Speak up, will you, Sam? That pounding I took with a bell may be a little hard of hearing. Have a cigar, Jordan. Oh, thanks, Sam. <laughs> colonel Bukhar is not very happy about the way things turned out. What did you say? I said the, the colonel is not very happy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Looks like the local boys beat him out of a feather in his cap. Huh? <laughs> oh, yes. And, of course, there is also a small matter of a reward. A what, sir? Every... Never mind, Jordan. I will see you later. Oh, uh, Sam. Yes? I mean, yes? Uh, about that reward, don't bother sending me my share. I'll be down to headquarters to pick it up. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Jordan. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Now, here again, with a brief word, is Rocky Jordan. Friends, I'm just another American, but one who lives almost halfway around the world from home. Believe me, there's no better way of learning to appreciate the American way of life, like being away from it. It's those who grow up with it, live with it, and have come to accept its benefits, who like to be reminded once in a while. Well, a little booklet came in the mail from the States this morning. I read it through in less than half an hour. But since then, I've read it a dozen times over. Its title is The Miracle of America. In those brief 19 pages, I learned more about what the American way of life means than anything I ever read before. It's straightforward, deals with facts, and it's endorsed by both management and labor. I wish everyone inside and outside America could read it. I'm sure it'll make a real impression on you. And best of all, this booklet is yours for the asking. Just write your local CBS station and ask for the miracle of America. All it takes is a penny postcard. Include your own name and address for mailing. Nothing more. Remember, address your own CBS station and ask for the miracle of America. Do that tonight, huh? Before you have a chance to forget. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. Same time, same station. And the story is Ace High Straight. Rocky Jordan, written tonight by Adrian Jando, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jay Novello as Captain Sam Sabaya. Original music composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell. Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>